Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast in which we discuss all things Beatles. Beatles as a group, Beatles as soloists, their past, their present, their future, this week their current stuff. I'm Alan Cozen, and I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you probably know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Ken, how are you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> Nice to hear from you, Alan. <laughs> Great. And Steve Marinucci, uh, who everyone reads on the internet pretty much all day long because he's constantly <laughs> posting um, Beatles news on Access, which is AXS.com, and uh, Billboard, regular contributor to Billboard now. Um, I don't think Billboard has had so much Beatles coverage in its – entire history as it has had in the last <laughs> several weeks <laughs> um and um and al sussman the executive editor of beetle fan how you doing al hey uh, alan how you doing hello there everybody okay and gosh is like anything going on this week with the <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. uh, uh, yeah. There it, is uh, yeah 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 so Okay, we're going to talk mostly, I guess, about eight days a week, which we probably have all seen between us about, what, 50 times, I think we've ended up. And which opened last Thursday as we speak. Today's recording this on Monday the 19th. It opened on the 15th um, in theaters. Some theaters, limited run. Some theaters have had it only for a day. Some are having it for a week. Um, and then immediately premiered on Hulu on Saturday the 17th. So um, we've had a chance to look at it, and you'll be surprised to hear that we have opinions. And uh, <laughs> Really? Yeah. No um, way. But also, it turns out that I mean, we should ask Steve how his uh, his version of it went, the live version, because he actually hosted a live screening of it. So, how was that, Steve? It was very nice. It was at the Elmwood Rialto Theater in, or I should say, Rialto Elmwood Theater in Berkeley, California. It was a full house. We I even gave away two copies of Pure McCartney, the the two CD version. And that was so that was fun, but it was it, everybody seen everybody enjoyed it. There were a lot of, and we'll get into the you know the various spots in the film, but uh, there was a lot of uh, applause and surprise at the clips. I mean, a lot of people obviously were not uh, familiar with as many of the clips as as we were, but they everybody enjoyed it. There was a lot. There was clapping at the end of the film. Everybody everybody was pleased. The uh, and, and the Sherry Stadium uh, footage went over very very well. Um, that that was um, that went over very well. But they really everybody really loved it. There are there were t the theater personnel were wearing t -shirt, white t shirts with the poster of the movie on it. For those of you that are interested in collectibles, and there were poster little mini posters and one sheets, a big the you know the big posters. And they actually asked me to sign theirs, which I know, which uh, which was kind of cool, mm -hmm. um, and I did. Um, but little old me. Um, but it was it was a fun evening. My my wife and my son went with us, and and it was great. Yeah, we had a great time. Uh, Berkeley is uh, not real close to me. It's a, a drive, but I've spent a lot of days in Berkeley when I used to go record hunting there. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So what did what did hosting it entail? Did you uh, did you have to talk about the film beforehand or? I, uh, uh, no, we didn't talk. I didn't talk about the film before, beforehand. All I did was introduce it and say and tell you know and let everybody know, warn everybody not to leave after the credits. Although there was the little warning at the beginning of the show, at the beginning of the film, to tell everybody right. about it. But I did tell them not to leave that there was more to come although a couple of people did leave that was kind of weird uh yeah. i guess they didn't they didn't they didn't either didn't care or they missed the they didn't catch the uh the the uh thing at the notice at the front of the movie but yeah, yeah i mean most everybody stayed for the shay uh 
and uh, you know, a lot of people stayed around at the end. And we we uh, we talked about there were a couple of people that had been to Candlestick, a couple of people that had been to the Cow Palace, you know, that had seen or had seen the Beatles. I think there was one person there that had been to the Hollywood Bowl. So we got you know we had a few people that had actually been to the, a couple of the shows and and could talk about that. And, but so that was fun. It was it was a lot of fun. Great. Did you find Great. there was a mixture of uh, of different ages? Just curious. Yes. Oh yes, there were. Uh, it was mostly old, uh, mostly older, you know, crowd. But there were there were some kids. There were a few kids there because I mean, there's nothing really in the film that, you know, to to push people. Uh, uh, you know, it wasn't really an adult film at all. I mean, it was for all ages. So, mm-hmm. um, in Portland, it was largely an older crowd. Mm-hmm. Same in Pittsburgh. Was yep. it full? Uh, were, were the shows? It was. It, it, Portland was mostly full, not entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, only one night here. When we got there, they said they said that they had sold half of the largest theater in the in the complex. So obviously, there were a lot of last minute walk ins. People who hadn't reserved their tickets in advance. Uh, I think we were well. We, yes, I don't know. The thing, we were definitely the first people there. Hmm. <laughs> but really. Yeah, and it turned out that the second person there, or the or the third after me and my wife, um, is a fan of the show, which was oh, nice. Wow. Really? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I did get to. I did that when they introduced me. I did. They did mention the show, and I also mentioned it during my little speech at the end. So. Yeah. Words get um, around. And Ken, yeah. Mm-hmm. How was the How was the audience where you were? Uh, for the most part, I would say it was about two thirds full, and mm-hmm. the age, uh, probably the, the the people there were about from their forties on up. I didn't really see mm-hmm. anybody younger than that. But I also noted that on that night, on Thursday, that theater had about four or five screenings of it, the same night. So mm-hmm. it's not as if really? anybody had to rush to uh, you know one screening. So it, it was probably spread out throughout the whole evening. Mm-hmm. And in the theater and that I went see? to, this was in Pleasantville, uh, mm-hmm. the Jacob Burns Art Cinema, and uh, they're running it for a full week. So, you know, anyone who's mm-hmm. really who really wants to see it on the big screen has a week to do it. But obviously, to see Shay, it had to be that first night. Oh, mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was only the first night. I thought no, I thought that in the theater at all. It was whenever no. It's they... the whole. It's the whole screening, Ken. No, I, whole... I was told that it was just the first day. No. No, no, no. It's supposed to be the uh, the 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 word when they announced it was it was going to be for the entire screening, because I saw it on Friday, which is the second day. So oh, okay. I, I see the makings of a class action suit against the theater in Pleasantville. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was it's it's every night. It's that, every night. It wasn't the theater that said that. I thought I read it online. So. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Well, don't so much. Blame the theater. Don't All blame right. the theater. Don't blame the theater. Okay. We take it back. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess we should talk about what our reactions to this film were. Shall we start with Steve, since we started there last time? Like I said, I saw it. I, I had it streamed stream to me before the a week before, so I had seen it before I went to the theater. And to be honest, I, I my reaction was kind of uh, oh, hum. I, you know, there a lot of the footage was was uh, stuff that I had seen before, and I wasn't really really excited about it. When I got to the theater, though, to see it at the theater was a different experience. It really worked better for me uh, up on the big screen, seeing the impact of the you know of them uh, of the Beatles on the big screen, the footage. Um, actually, that particular night when I went in, they they let me. They had showed the Shea Stadium stuff in a smaller theater. We got the uh, I my screening had the the biggest theater in the in the um, in the theater, uh, and um, I saw I did see the Shea Stadium stuff close up, and I was and the impact was amazing. I was just my mouth dropped. I was floored by how good the Shea Stadium stuff looked. Never mind the fact that um, with the 4K uh, restoration and the the blow up on the big screen, it looked a little grainy. I didn't mm-hmm. care. I thought it was. Mm-hmm. I 
was mm. really pleased. And not only that, the uh, the uh, listening to Ringo sing "Act Naturally," mm. uh, warts and all, was was wonderful. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, I'm that glad they, they kept we, that in there, the real version. Yeah, yeah. right. So, yeah, same here. I, I and I, you know, I meant to do it today. And see uh, how much of the uh, the overdubbing was taken out, but I believe a lot of the over overdubbing was taken out, especially at the end um, with well, "I'm Down." Except that in "Twist and Shout," they actually put the can, right. the, the mm. record version in yes. under the yes. So. I was I was yeah. I know I noticed that too. I, you couldn't help but notice that, and I wondered why the hell they did that because the because I was listening to the. Uh, I was listening to one of the bootlegs yesterday, and it didn't sound that bad. Why did no. they do? That? Why know. did they? Do, I don't know why they did that. That was the only song they did that to. Yeah. Um, hmm. I yeah, I was really amazed. At, I was really surprised at that. Now it's that, been said, and I I didn't notice it myself, but I think Al did, um, and other people have that they flew in some of Georgia's lead guitar filigree and act naturally and mm-hmm. added that yeah that and i and i think also there were some elements of the studio recording even in uh on babies in black because it didn't it just parts of it just did not sound live somebody online said that they thought they heard a um, acoustic guitar i didn't um hmm. but somebody else i think somebody else mentioned that online but I, I mean, yeah, they they obviously did a little bit of messing with the with the sound. Yeah. But I, I but still, it's I mean, the theater I was in did not have a really distinct stereo. I don't know how you guys heard it, but uh, my mine didn't have a really distinct stereo. Uh, sound no. System. Not really. No. So, uh, which I was kind of hoping for, but uh, it still sounded what, great. What you got in what you got in stereo was the fans which some of which was also yeah. apparently flown in from hollywood bowl <laughs> and um really no it's what i've heard yeah um and also you got a little stereo effect on the very heavy reverb that giles martin added and i believe his license should be suspended because <laughs> this is the second production where he's added reverb that really wasn't necessary to to uh you know the sound of something and um someone needs to give him a talking to <laughs> hmm. Hmm. but uh but other than that i mean i thought the movie looked great and then i watched it again today and if you watch it and just listen to the dialogue in a kind of a serious manner there's kind of a darker there's kind of a darker meaning there Mm-hmm. And that yeah. doesn't come through. That doesn't come through in the footage. And I was thinking, you know, if they had done, if they had gone through with this and really made it a real documentary, which it, which I'm going to say it's not. But if they had made it a real documentary and made it a little darker, I think it would have been a little bit more effective. Not that it isn't bad, but I think it would have made the point a lot better because it was supposed to be about the touring years, and and you know even the title. Eight days a week indicates that this was an incredible, a monstrous, monstrous uh, thing on them, you know, to have to, you know, all those years, and and it just comes off very lightly with the, you know, with the Beatlemania footage and all that stuff. And I don't know. I I, I thought hmm. it. I thought it really kind of captured the claustrophobia that, that yeah. they felt touring. And the only other, you know, I mean, we've all read tons and tons of books and, you know, seen lots of documentaries. Mm-hmm. And the only other thing that I thought captured that claustrophobia quite that way was Bob Spitz's book. Pretty much the only thing I can say, you know, on behalf mm. of Bob Spitz's Bob book, Spitz's book. <laughs> is that it really, really captured how boring and you know i mean you know just hard for them being cooped up and you know Mm -hmm. all of that and and the film showed more of that than we usually see i mean there was it didn't really begin to emerge till like you know the 65 section they start saying that george is already beginning to complain and and i think they I, i don't know that they could have okay i don't know that apple you know in an official beatles project could have made it much darker than it already is in this Mm. i think i think enough was conveyed you know to to give you a sense of how wearing this was on them and i think that it's as far as they'd be willing to go 
Yeah. Mm. You know, I saw a quote from Ron Howard where he said he didn't want to project the the darker side of the tours, even though some of that is captured anyway. I mean, look at 1966 and how they mm-hmm. went into detail on that. But I think that yeah. it really captured all the different angles of touring and everything they were doing because they were so active during those years. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, on, so that, on that level, I think they really succeeded. <laughs> Taking it not only from the Beatles angle, but from the fans, mm-hmm. you know, um, the mania part of it all. Uh, right. I think it captured all of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you know, for, for a 90-minute documentary, it, 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 it did a really pretty good job. Um, and the more I watched it, which I think I saw it four or five times, the more I kind of enjoyed it, really. I mean, I got I got a little less critical. The first time I, I went through it, I was sort of very critical of, mm. you know, because I, <laughs> I was very, you know, looking for, okay, oh, really, why is that colorized, you know, and and, <laughs> and that kind of stuff and making note of, of all of these things and of missed opportunities and of which I thought there were quite a number. I was going to um, ask about the hmm. missed opportunities because I, I saw your comment about that. Yeah, yeah. you know, okay – just to choose one. Okay. Okay, Candlestick Park. Candlestick Park, you know, if you blinked, you almost would have missed the whole thing. You heard more right. about the truck that they were sliding around on. And, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and now we have footage of Candlestick Park. I mean, in addition to the new stuff they found, you know, from some woman who apparently had it under her bed undeveloped. Right. There's mm-hmm. newsreel footage and there's – plus there's Tony Barrow's cassette – which, mm-hmm. given that he's, you know, it's not super fidelity, but he's standing near the stage, not in the audience, so you actually can hear the performance. This is a really historical performance because it's the last one. I would have wished that they had maybe given us some of that performance. Mm-hmm. In addition, um, I don't know, I could swear I've seen photos of these things, but at least, you know, heard about them the the two things about Candlestick Park that kind of really put the uh, the final stamp on it is that that first of all that they asked Tony Barrow to do it and if right. if someone could have found a photo of Tony Barrow standing there with his cassette recorder that would have been nice I I, mm. I can't remember whether I've seen such a thing or not and I think I've seen a picture of the Beatles taking the selfie mm-hmm. you know and not to mention there is the selfie itself that since the Beatles took it, presumably one of them has it. The fact that they never brought cameras on stage and shot anything, but for this they did and they shot a selfie. I kind of think that like if that was shown, that would have made it, I think, a bit more poignant, you know, mm-hmm. plus a bit of the performance. So it's that kind of thing I mean when I say missed opportunity, um, because what you got instead is, yeah, and we got to Candlestick Park and we were in a truck and we sloshed around. We decided we didn't like it anymore. You know, yeah, yeah. I I was surprised that they didn't put more emphasis. You know, when you you know considering the fact that there was their last concert. Yeah, I'm surprised that that they kind of went through it as quickly as they did. And and yes, I mean there is that uh, you know that John Lennon selfie that right. he took. Yeah, uh, and mm-hmm. um, and that that didn't appear anywhere. And and even though only a couple of the Jim Marshall uh, photographs. Right. Right. So and, it's like they they did kind of they did give it short shrift. Yeah. And at the other end, you know, we've got those Hamburg recordings, which, mm. you know, uh, well, not to mention a gazillion photos from Hamburg. They just showed a little bit and it was it was kind of conflated with early Liverpool, you know, that's one thing <laughs> that I would love to be able to ask. Uh, either Ron Howard or, or any of the producers is why did they really not spend that much time at all on Hamburg because those were such important years in developing mm-hmm. the band. That's where they became mm-hmm. a great live band. And even if all you had, for the most part, were still photos, that's still something, just in terms of its historical importance. Well, it, ex- except that it is called the touring years. That's true. And really well, during that period, they were just doing those ses- those seasons at, you know, at the Star Club or at the Cavern or, right. you know, wherever. You know, they weren't really – they didn't really begin to tour until the beginning of 63. Mm-hmm. And another th- – and, and actually to kind of counterbalance what, uh, what Alan was just saying, I was very surprised at how quickly – 
they went through 63. You know, mm. and there's there's almost there's very little footage at all from 63. Mm-hmm. It's uh, now I realize that, uh, you know, there's obviously no footage from those early tours and you, most of the TV shows, at least the ones that are still that still survive are really just lip syncs. But there, uh, you know, there, there is there's the, the the Swedish drop in show when you have about. Mm-hmm. I don't know, five seconds of them bowing <laughs> right. mm-hmm. at the end of that. And I mean, that's, that's one of the, the, you know, probably one of the best performances of theirs on video. Mm-hmm. And we didn't get, you know, even, even us, you know, even a, a little sliver of that. I was curious uh, with some of the people that they, they had talking, you know, they had, they used for comments. I mean, Whoopi Goldberg's comments were were really good. I I have to say, I but I kept her. looking. I kept looking at Richard Curtis, and I'm going, where the hell have I seen him before? I had to look him up in IMDb. He's the producer of Pirate Radio, which of course you know tells a lot about um, you know tells about the that the 60s era mm-hmm. uh, radio Caroline and stuff. So that's where he comes in. But still, I mean, some of the you know uh, I, I guess the you know the natural thing to do when you have these documentaries and these talking heads is to, to figure out you know what their connection is to the whole thing. I, I was surprised going back to Missed Opportunity I was surprised they glossed over Philippines. I mean that was mm-hmm. a major I mean that was probably the worst moment they, they'd ever had and they just barely talked about it. Mm-hmm. And another thing I noticed was they played did you notice they played Good Day Sunshine over the protests? Which I thought was yeah. what? What are they what are, what what? what, what? Kind of I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was kind of awkward. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I did, you know, I, I mean, it was good. I mean, you, you know, somebody called it, somebody early on looking to make a comment very quickly online said, called it anthology light. I don't yeah, think that's. Yeah, which it, no, not, a, not at all. Not at all. So that, yeah, no. especially after seeing it a couple of times, you know, but uh, no, it was, it was. On it the was, other hand, com- complete Beatles yeah. heavy. It could be. <laughs> could right. Work. Right. It was a little uh, bit like the complete uh, Beatles in a way, you know. It, you know, in a way, although I, the, the one thing that I don't understand is why, considering that there's an Apple-sanctioned collection of their appearances on the Ed Sullivan Show, mm-hmm. why they used a clip that's probably about the same quality as what Alan and I were trading in the early '80s when we were when we yeah. were trading videos. That was well, surprising. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, Maybe but, one of you can talk about this from a technical standpoint. But there are certain things like Ed Sullivan, like Shea Stadium, where you've seen cleaner prints now. I mean, the, the yeah. Shea from Anthology, to me, yeah. was brighter, you know, a, a, so clear, and yet it's grainier on the big screen. Maybe it's well, just because it's on the big screen. I, that it, it might could be. be. I yeah. think so. Um, you know what seemed to be the case with Shea is um, the the graininess changed depending what they were showing. I mean, the pictures of the fans were spectacular, you know. Mm. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And because the cameraman could get right up there with the pictures of the Beatles, those were sort of zoomed in and they became right. grainy, I think, that way, you know, they or they were enlarged afterwards. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I think that took a toll that we don't see on a smallish screen, but on the big screen, I, I think you could see what was going on a bit mm-hmm. more in that way that it lost some quality. But yeah, I mean, it's still in terms of the the color and everything. It 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 really did look incredible. Mm-hmm. So, it really well, did, it, yeah. it, it did kind of give me an anthology feel to it, though, because oh, yeah. let's mm-hmm. face it, where John and George are concerned, there are limited interviews, right? And right. dealing with this particular subject, and with George, they kept going back to the anthology, mm-hmm. right? So kind of reminded me a lot of the anthology for that reason yeah, yeah except sure. that it was it was faster paced much faster paced oh yeah sure than, mm-hmm. than the anthology 
Yeah. Uh, and I think that may be part of the problem. I think they, you know, the between that and having the kind of contemporary celebrities and things like that, obviously, you know, uh, Ron Howard in every interview that I've uh, either seen or heard with him said that he had to, uh, you know, keep, you know, walking this fine line between chaos and creation. <laughs> there you go again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, between, you know, making a film for the hardcore fans and making a film for the, if you want to say it, the, the millennials uh-huh, and, yeah. and if well, you're, and making a film for the millennials, they have to presumably because of the <laughs> lack of attention span that a lot of them have, mm-hmm. um, you have to, uh, speed it up. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. So that I may think uh, mm-hmm. he may have walked the line between the millennials and the hardcore fans, but I don't think he was ever on the side of the line where the hardcore fans are. I, I because agree. In, in what respect? Even, you know, I, I would say that there was maybe five minutes of stuff we haven't seen. Um, there was a bit more stuff that we haven't heard. I mean, there were, they, they mm-hmm. brought in a bunch of studio outtakes that, um, yeah, you know, heard the, the I, I, or, yeah, I but, love those. I, you know, I, I, I was sitting there thinking afterwards, I was going, God, you know, they could do two hours of that. That would have been amazing, you know, to, to really, uh, you know, to really, uh, put, put some, uh, do some uh, work on that, on that studio material and, and put that in the theater in a good sound system. And yeah. some of those Larry, some of those Larry Kane uh, radio actualities, not the interviews, because the the interviews he's he's so he's put those out. But there were some radio actualities from reports yes. of his that mm-hmm. at least he says he doesn't even have, and he has you know, no idea where they came good. from. Those were good. I mean, you've yeah. got Larry Kane right in 1964, 65, mm-hmm. and I think it was a 64 section saying yes. he was reporting on the dangers that they face while traveling you know it it's mm-hmm. like now we look back at it as being you know like that but he was reporting that right at the time this is this is dangerous yeah. for these guys um, mm-hmm. and i thought that that was a good a good little clip you know lots of other good little a lot of the okay you know a lot of the interesting stuff and the stuff that maybe collectors hadn't seen was more to do with things like press conferences and things like that mm-hmm. cane clip than performance footage. I mean, there was a little bit of performance footage from, you know, the handheld things that, mm-hmm. you know, that we hadn't seen, but they only showed 10 seconds at a time, you know? Mm. Um, and in terms of, you know, our perpetual debate about, you know, hardcore fans versus newcomers, <laughs> I mean, first of all, I didn't really see any newcomers in the theater, but maybe no. that's for Hulu. But second, you know, you were mentioning about the Sweden show and how little we got yeah. of that. Well, you know, I think you don't have to be a hardcore fan, you know, like, like showing a clip, a full performance of at least one song from that show would have served newcomers mm-hmm. really well better oh, yeah. than mm-hmm. yeah no you question. Know, so it's not even i think that hardcore fans you know just want to see stuff that we haven't seen before it's not just that it's like okay you know use the material that you have even if we already know it to in the best way it can be used rather than just sort of clip through it and you know, oh yeah yeah sweden so we can point to it and say sweden and a newcomer may not know it mm-hmm. but that doesn't help anybody you know it's yeah. like you want to see yeah. those performances because they were hot right. although fact, the coliseum was hot but it was yeah. just sort of annoying seeing it in color yeah Why well, no, uh, did you feel that way? although yeah i was Alan. gonna i was gonna bring that up too because i uh, i didn't think you know as much as i hate colorized stuff the color in there didn't bother me. It no, really it didn't sense. bother me actually yeah. either. Mm. And actually, Blackpool Night Out was in color. That's right. There were a number of things. Mm-hmm. The press conference at Kennedy was colorized. Right. Right. Mm. Uh, right. Yep. Uh, the I mean, NME 1964 was colorized. Right. I mean, I ha- I hate colorized movies for the most part, but the color stuff, the Washington stuff, looks so good. I mean, oh mm. man, that was just great to see. And they also. Yeah. They also, you could tell, had worked on the sound on that too. It sounded mm. so good in the theater. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean, I, 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 
don't have, uh, you know, I would be the first one to complain about colorized, but in this particular case, they did such a good job on those. Oh God, that they, it looked really good. Yeah. To Alan's point about the, um, you know, about increasing the amount of the music, uh, I did hear an interview on a, uh, <clears throat> a hem, um, another Beatles podcast last week with Nigel Sinclair, mm-hmm. uh, who said <laughs> that he had been uh, that he had tested out various prints of the film for people, and at least in one of them, the feeling was that there was too much music. Really? So, yeah. So oh. that's that's why they may have cut back on <laughs> things like the drop-in show, you know, or the Washington Coliseum, where only where we only get one song. <laughs> that's really something. I yeah. mean, if I wanted to see a documentary about a musician that didn't have any music in it, it, it should be Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're happy for that man, I tell you. Very good, Alan. That was good. that was a great, great way to dig that in there. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard for um, me. It's hard for me to understand this about about uh, uh, a millennial or a new fan. You're talking about a lack of attention span. Those Beatles songs from that time were two minutes long. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's I mean, right. I, how can they not sit through two minutes? Would that be just, you know, requiring mm-hmm. too much of them? But uh, the question is, right. how many of those songs would you allow in, in a documentary? And really and truly, an hour and a half really flew right by in the it theater. Did. I couldn't yes. believe how quick. As, as soon as I was really getting into it, it was over. Mm-hmm. So... But I think one of the things which is, I shouldn't really call it a disappointment because I really enjoyed the film. But from the yeah. very start when this was originally called the Beatles Live Project and Apple was soliciting from fans material that we hadn't seen before, we were of the impression that this would be mainly a lot of live performances that, you know, a lot, is either very rare, hasn't been seen, or, you know, stuff that has been around. And, and probably in the best quality, all mixed together. But this really mm-hmm. was, the strength of this film really comes from the narrative of it and telling the mm-hmm. story through yeah. all the different interviews. And I really enjoyed Paul and Ringo's current interviews mixed with archival interviews and all the different celebrities that they mixed together as well. I, I would mean, love to know where they changed their, what, what made them change their focus from what we were expecting to what they ended up with. Um, well, would, another one of the concepts of, I mean, if you remember, one of the, I guess, probably the original concept when they were soliciting all of that fan footage was mm-hmm. that they, this was supposed to be fairly heavy with fan reminiscences. And right. there was very little of that. And uh, we were talking before, uh, before we began recording that uh, I, I have a, I have a strong hunch that, you know, if we had had an, an hour and a half of, you know, George has sexy eyelashes and mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to love Paul McCartney uh, when I'm 110 years old, you know, an hour and a half of that probably would have made people's head ex- heads explode after about 15 minutes. Well, yeah. I mean, if they if they were recording, I mean, they did a whole bunch of recordings, uh, interviews at uh, Candlestick Park were at the McCartney show. They could mm-hmm. have edited that down. In fact, I know somebody who was interviewed there who also showed up at the Berkeley screening and told me. Was and and it, Na- that Nancy was Nancy yeah, and it looks like Nancy's going to be part of the the DVD extras, which we'll get into in a little bit. But mm-hmm. I mean, I think they're saving some of that for that. But it's it's a shame that more of that wasn't used. I mean, it would have been nice to have, you know, fans in there too a little bit. But well, you know, what, what can you say? I think I think we had just enough of that, and it was contemporary. <laughs> you know, I mean, I liked seeing. I, I get it. I get a kick out of seeing. You know, the, these little girls in 1964 going nuts. But I don't know that mm-hmm. I'd want to see them today, talking about how they went nuts. Mm-hmm. Unless, of course, mm-hmm. there's a corny Weaver. That's a different mm-hmm. story. Right. But, uh, <laughs> and you know, yeah, by the way, oh, I was just going to say one thing that, uh, when the I don't know how about uh, how it was with you guys, but. When the Sigourney Weaver clip came on in the theater, you could hear all these. <gasps> a lot of people had not was not, were not aware of that, and it 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 had a lot of people surprised. 
they Go could ahead, have Ken. put a little circle or an arrow or something because I think it went past a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I think I think really? there were people who didn't quite realize that that was her, you know, yeah. as a kid. I thought it was her, but it went by so quickly that I questioned it, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in the theater, that were, the theater where I saw the film, one thing that kind of disturbed me about this, and I had my wife with me, who is a first-generation fan, who saw the Beatles in concert in 1966, a lot of the people in the audience were laughing at the girls screaming and fainting, and they couldn't really understand it. They couldn't relate mm-hmm. to it. And since a lot of them were in their 40s and up, and some of them, I'm sure, were first-generation fans, I'm kind of surprised that they had that kind of a reaction to it. Well, there is, there is kind of a... There is, there is kind of a quaintness to it. Yeah, it's a bit know. zany. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And especially, I, I keep thinking of the the one the blonde girl there in the shave footage, who's kind yes. of looks kind of glum. I mean, that, yeah. that was that was kind of funny. And then the 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 girls climbing up on the fence, kind of going, you know, you could see him, you could see what they were mouthing, you know, Paul, John, you know. I mean, that was funny. I, I think it was Ken. I mean, their reactions were were a little um, over the top, shall we say. But uh, no, I, I, I didn't see a problem with that. Uh, I, di- I didn't. I, but Joanne did, huh? Yeah, because she lived through all that, and she felt that way. I mean, she didn't, mm-hmm. she didn't go overboard <laughs> like those girls, mm-hmm. but she understood why they felt the way they did. Mm, I think looking back, I think a lot of people are amu- somewhat amused by that um, now. I mean, they realize what... what you know, it was them at a younger age, and but uh, but on the same note, there were also people who uh, I heard Nancy was one of them who watched the movie and were very well were very struck by what they saw because they related to it so well. So um, uh, you know, on that note, uh, you know, I mean, it, it it hit people in different ways. You have to say that. So I wanted to bring up one of the people that were interviewed, one of the people mm-hmm. that was interviewed was Ed Freeman, who was mm-hmm. one of the roadies. Yeah. You know, yeah. Which, yeah. I, I never, which I, I never knew. Yeah. I never knew that either. We always heard about Mal and Neil. Yeah. But um, right. I looked up Ed Freeman, and he was a roadie for The Remains. So he was on the tour there for three weeks. Yeah. In 66. Mm, right. And I also looked online, and there was a roadie for The Circle as well, who's not in the film. But I'm sure, uh-huh. I don't even know if that roadie is still alive. But it, mm. it's nice that they... That they dug up this person <laughs> and yeah. a little bit of research and interviewed him. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That was a, a, a little bit of new information of a sort of asterisk footnote kind of quality. Right. I thought they did a really nice job with, um, dealing with Brian Epstein. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, and George Martin, maybe a little mm-hmm. less George Martin, because we know so much about him. And, you know, uh, whereas to a lot of people, Brian is still a little bit of an enigma. And I think that they mm-hmm. handled Brian really, really well. Um, I think I what I, I really like that quote of Paul saying that sort of he saw bigger things for us than we saw for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So there were a lot of little things, you know, again, not particularly music, but just, you know, other bits of information and things that came through. And and um, a lot of them, you know, the more you watch it, the more you see them, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Did you notice, by the way, that Sid Bernstein was not in the film, uh, either film? He was That's he true. did not he did not introduce it, it, the introduction was not in the main film, and it was not in the Shea film, which kind of, that kind of surprised me. There was the poster, the brief poster, and right. that was that was the only time you saw his name. And he got the screen credit in in Shea too. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You're right. Mm-hmm. I also so. noticed that uh, there was no mention of Pete Best. Uh, there were, pi- there were no, there were pictures. There there were pictures that flashed by very quickly. But yeah, you're right. Uh, I was gonna. I wanted to say one of the most interesting things that any of the the people interviewed said for me, and it wasn't all that shocking, but it was very heartfelt, was when Ringo was talking about 1966 and how things really changed. And even before they toured that year, because, you know, John had already been married and he had not only uh, you know, Cynthia, but Julian. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Ringo had gotten married and, he, and they had Zach and they spent a lot of time in their new homes. And so they weren't in each other's pockets you know every single day 
So they kind of grew a little bit apart, you know, for a short time. So it gave them some space and some mm-hmm. some breathing room there before they went back and, you know, and, and toured again and got real busy with the recording. So I found that to be really interesting because we all know the craziness of 1966 and everything that happened to them on the road. But even before that, things were changing, mm-hmm. certainly on the home front, which I found to be really interesting that they had a life mm-hmm. beyond the Beatles. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that I noticed as well, um, just to sort of skip around topics, uh, is in the Washington Coliseum film, um, when Paul asks everyone to clap their hands and stomp their feet, in the film, that cuts to John doing his, um, you know, what he used to call his cripples thing, right. you know, um, which is very un-PC now, and they yeah. basically substituted another shot. Mm-hmm. That struck me. And the thing about that is, I mean, you can you can argue about whether or not that should be shown at this point. I mean, it, it was what he did. He was, he did it a lot um, on one hand. and on the, But on the other hand, it seemed to me that if you didn't want to show that, you should have shown another clip because having it cut to anybody who knows the footage, you know, it's going to bring it to mind. Hey, the, you know, John's thing is is being deleted, whereas if they just use a different song – you wouldn't have even thought about it, you know. And if I recall correctly, I think the same thing happens in the Shea Stadium film, mm-hmm. uh, with basic, basically the same intro, you know, the same type of introduction. Yeah. Uh, and it just goes to a different, you know, it it just goes to a different shot. Yeah. And <laughs> so. and again, in uh, you know, okay, I don't know if this counts as a lost opportunity because they did show something from Shea in in the main film. It's just, I guess, a matter of, you know, we're all, you know, little directors at heart. I think if it were me, if it were me I was going to show one clip from Shay, I would probably show I'm down because that, you know, with John going crazy. Right. On the- all exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> That's just the one. So, yeah. And just to see John and George crack up together. Yeah. You know, and, uh, <laughs> you know right next to each other on stage. It's, that's one of my favorite moments. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, yeah. like Paul, Paul twirling around, you know. Yes. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, there were also a lot of little things in Shay that I didn't, you know, I don't, how many gazillion times have I watched that film that I've never noticed before? Um, and then went back to the film and they're there. I don't know why I didn't notice them. But for instance, in um, A Hard Day's Night, when it gets to the bridge, John sort of like hands it off to Paul with a big hand gesture, and you know, pointing to Paul. Paul's oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And he does it tw- twice when the, the, both times that they do the bridge. Um, and for some reason, I just uh, either hadn't seen it or hadn't noticed it or maybe on a small screen it didn't quite register in quite that way. But up there on the big screen, I, I thought that was kind of a funny moment. Oh, well, plus also during the, you know, the, the, the performances, the performance of a hard day's night in most of the prints of uh, of the show we're kind of distracted by Brian Epstein's comments. Right. So, right. so maybe that. And know, so we we're, also, we're busy listening to that and not really watching the band. And so, and so because we're listening to that, we don't see as now sort of jumped out. And I looked back in the film and it was always there. Yeah. They showed George's guitar being a Gretsch for a little bit, you know, they, they, which as you know, you, you see him at the beginning of the song switch to the Rickenbacker mm-hmm. and he plays the Rickenbacker for that song. But they use some footage apparently from another song because at one point they sort of zoom in on the Gretsch, which is not playing in that song. So, uh, hmm. but you know, it, I had never noticed it before, but mm. there it is, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Does it bother anyone that they didn't use um, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby just for the audio at the end? Yeah. Yeah, I think that they should have used that, and they should have used She's a Woman in their places in the set and just used some of the other footage or, you know, footage and stills or, you know, or as we saw in the the Eight Days a Week clip on OnePlus, you know, they could have they could have manufactured something that looked like they were playing those songs. Mm. But, um, if, they, if they went to the trouble of digging out the uh, act naturally, yeah, uh, there is no reason not to do that. So, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. well. Now, do they actually have footage of everybody's trying to be my baby? No. No. No, no there, there's, the, there's no footage of those two songs. Okay. Mm-hmm. I know about She's a Woman because yeah. the camera stopped in the middle. Right. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. and if they did ever have Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, as we know from our visit with Dave Schwenson, mm-hmm. they no longer mm-hmm. do. Yeah. So they would right. have to use, you know, the helicopter footage or something else, you know, during who knows what. But it, it, whatever they used, it, I, I think it would have been nice to hear the whole set start to finish uninterrupted in the order that they played it you know right. mm-hmm. so maybe that's not maybe that's why they're not including it in the dvd they're waiting to hear what we have to say about this <laughs> edit so that maybe. they can then do it right before they actually put it out yeah <laughs> right we are the determining mm-hmm. factor that's shall right we, shall we pivot over to the dvd release mm-hmm. with, sure. okay we now Let's have see. info about so what does everyone feel about the extras? Does it bother you, for instance, that we're going to get 12 minutes of performance footage with five whole songs only on a well, two it, set? It would be it would be a little bit more enlightening if we knew where those songs come from, mm-hmm. you know, instead of just the songs themselves. I mean, you know. <laughs> Which twist and shout from where? Yeah. Which she right. loves you, right? Mm-hmm. You right. Know, which can't buy me love? Which which you can't do that? Although I would kind of assume that's probably from Melbourne, right? Maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, but yeah, just those you know eleven minutes is not. <laughs> Yeah, as you know, as George says to Lauren Michaels when he turns up to play Saturday Night Live, and Michaels right. explains to him that you know, if, I thought if it was three thousand dollars for four of you, seven fifty for one would be, you know. And George says it's it's a bit chintzy if you ask me. Mm. That's how I feel I, about this, you know. I, I mm. don't understand the Ronnie Spector and the Beatles segment mm. at all. Really? Because, uh, because I mean, first of all, Ronnie's credibility is not exactly high as far as you know what she has to say, and and also, what does it have to do with with the Beatles touring? Because when the Ronettes backed up the Beatles on the '66 tour, she wasn't there because Phil mm-hmm. wouldn't let her out of the house. Right. So, right, and, and that one of the reasons for that could have been her interaction with them during the '64 tour, uh, which I de- which I doubt is what they're going to show us. You know, yeah, right. I'm exactly. sure. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Although that's that, that's what I mean is that Ronnie has been has spent you know <laughs> many years talking about how she had this affair with John and she had this affair with George and. Da 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 da, and um, you know, and it's, uh, it's apparently you know a few a few grains of truth there, but not a whole lot. And 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 another thing, uh, the the Beatles in Japan uh, item. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about that number for two. It says, and also the alternative opening for the film. Because uh, Universal confirmed to me that there was an a- an alternative edit for Japan mm-hmm. of the film, yeah. and so I'm wondering if that's what we're going to see or or what exactly that is. The, there's no real description there as to what that's going to be. So there's also yeah. a feature for the Beatles in Australia, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So you've got Australia right. and you've got Japan. And they're probably like a well, couple of minutes each. Some pieces. Yeah, Australia. Australia, you can pre- pretty well figure what that's going to be because you know that'll be all the the crowds and everything like that. Um, mm. But but yeah, I mean I'm you know I'm real curious there. What I wish they had put a little more description on those on those things. Um, told everybody the what the hell that was. Interview all. with an interview with three Beatles fans. You know. Yeah. <laughs> we're, all, we're all waiting for that. Um, right. I, I, I really, you know, I mean, obviously, I just sort of wish that it was, first of all, Shay, of um, mm-hmm. you know, but maybe some other performance stuff to have it limited to 11, 12 minutes is just sort of like a head scratcher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially if, you know, the decision had been made to 
not put as much music in as they originally planned, okay, fine, then put more in the bonus features. Mm-hmm. And that apparently is not the uh, – not the plan, because especially the uh, you know the longer form pieces, you know the music, uh, words and music segment, and the uh, and the the special special feature touching on the Beatles as a collective, you know, don't appear to have much in the uh, in the way of uh, uh, of music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah, it's weird. It's very strange. So, Alan, um, are the Beatles and Mozart comparable in the amount of uh, uh, <laughs> the amount of great melodies? Um, in the the amount of, I mean, <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, it's a different thing. But uh, I, I thought he was a little hard on Schubert, actually, saying that only a, <laughs> only a hundred of his eight hundred songs. Was <laughs> you know, I mean, really, the Beatles only. I mean, they're 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 total official output is only a bit more than 200 songs right i mean <laughs> and, and and some of those are covers so i don't know what in, in in terms of this big explosion of invention that he's talking about i'm not sure how that compares to people who've written you know close to a thousand things but but i mean his point was was well taken which is that you know there's hardly any bad Beatles stuff. I mean, everything they did, you know, was mm-hmm. inventive and and memorable. And by the way, during that little clip where they go from Sgt. Pepper to Let It Be, you know, to say, and then they put mm-hmm. out a bunch more albums and then they played on the rooftop, mm-hmm. uh, they basically chose sort of one selection or less <laughs> from each yeah. album. And for the White Album, it was, folks... Revolution Nine. Okay, well, that's, oh, your, that's your influence, Alan. Wow. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, I, I was I was actually very pleased to, to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I'll tell you one thing that kind of bothered me is that, um, you know, we're, we're looking at the Beatles as a live act around the world, and throughout this documentary, in the bottom right mm. corner, it would keep giving you the Beatles albums and their chart performance in the UK. And Please right. Please Me was number one for 30 weeks. And all that's great. But that doesn't mean that that's how it was in the rest of the world. And even in America, if you grew up with the American albums, you couldn't relate to Please Please mm-hmm. Me. You're only talking about how it, well it did in the U.K. Which and, yet the, really and, right. yet, and yet the film itself was very, very U.S.-centric. Right. So, yeah. That's and people point. in other countries are complaining about that. Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in One especially in England, they should. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a, a sense even even in some of the promotional interviews that um, Ringo Paul and Ron Howard did. I mean, the, <laughs> they haven't gotten very far, but a few people have asked. You know, they they were from Liverpool. How come Liverpool is you know not really dealt with an awful lot? You know, and they sort of glided over the answer for that. But um, yeah, and in terms of you know. Can American charts were dealt with in the um, February '64 section, where you've got George talking about how they've got five songs at number one. That's true, right? And John says, "Big head." However, they show <laughs> they show "I Want to Hold Your Hand" at number one, and it's you know it's it's kind of a fake thing. It's not like an actual billboard or cash box page because it gives the wrong number for for the single it gives uh capital 5150 which is the number for can't buy me love it should be 5112 mm. Mm. my yeah. father was right i am a cesspool of useless knowledge <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> is that what he told you oh, yes okay. uh. <laughs> he he said it with a smile however. <laughs> okay and you know once again paul told the story how the yeah. Beatles wouldn't come to America unless yeah. they had a number one hit, which, you know, I've tried to defend him right and left. <laughs> and I don't know yeah. if I can even do it anymore because sometimes I think he means they wouldn't tour America until they had a number one. But if he's referring to being on Ed Sullivan, I mean, yeah. that was all booked before the single. I want to yeah. Yes, as, as, Ringo, as Ringo points out, taking up George's role in the anthology. Mm. You know, in the anthology with George, he says, oh, yeah, it's a good thing because we happen to be booked to go there. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> now, in this time, Ringo followed up by saying, uh, "Yeah, and you know, we were we were booked to go on Ed Sullivan and, and all of that." So, so that, that Paul says that, and it's also in both the anthology and this, it's immediately countered with the sort of mm. reality. How do you yeah. all feel about the way the whole segregation issue was handled? Because they certainly have brought that up in, in many of these interviews, that it's a big yeah. point about, uh, about their touring and the stand that the Beatles took in, uh, in Jacksonville. I thought that was good. I, I thought that yeah. was good, actually. I, I was very pleased with, with the fact they did that. It, it kind of went against the not-so-serious tone of most of the rest of the movie, but I'm glad they, I'm glad they did that. I'm very glad they did that. Hmm. Yeah. Although there is one little thing that uh, there's a you know a clip of Larry Kane saying that uh, they're you know not sure if the Beatles will play this concert in Jacksonville. It's it wasn't because of the segregation situation. It was because there was a hurricane. Right. That hmm. that nearly prevented them from flying into uh, um, uh, into Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it kind of conveniently dovetails. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah. uh, and, 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 you know, and frankly, we really didn't know about the, uh, you know, that clause until basically, uh, you know, Chuck Gunderson, you know, unearthed it in his research for uh, for some fun tonight. Right. I think it was out before a little before that, but but well, yeah, I think okay. But it's people, been recent, think, it, right? I think a lot of people. It, I think a lot of people learned about it recently, but yeah. So I'm not sure about the context of the you know the contemporary interviews from '64 with Paul talking about segregation. I don't know whether he was being directly asked about Jacksonville or what. So it is kind of kind of creative um, creative revisionism, if you will. Yeah, there was a bit of that, a, a bit of a bit of messing with chronology to make things work. Um, mm. But but I think in terms of that as a point, I think it was an important thing to mention because also you know otherwise it's like Steve sort of said it's you know there's a lot of frivolity going on to do with the Beatles tour and all the screaming and the hair mm-hmm. and you know, whatever and this is you know this was serious stuff and oh uh, yeah mm-hmm. so I, I was glad that they made as big a deal of it as they did actually mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but do you, do you but guys was, remember you know, it getting do you remember it getting coverage at the time when no it happened? no 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 I don't rem- I don't remember not it at, all, at all not at all I was like nine or ten, you know. So yeah, I'm not sure I, would have well, I, was, I was I was a little older than that, but yeah, yeah I, I was I was fourteen, and I and I've been I was already a news uh, a news hound, mm. and uh, I don't remember <laughs> at getting any coverage at least at least not in New York, you know, maybe maybe down south, but uh, certainly didn't get any in New York. Mm-hmm. And that and that uh, Florida concert thing would have would have definitely gotten coverage down there, but I don't remember yeah. hearing it from that back then. Mm-hmm. I do want to mention one thing here, which I think will disappoint all of you, and that is that, that at the very end of the film, when they have the credits and they're listing all the songs that were used, mm-hmm. um, apparently we have the wrong title of the Beatles song that we use in our show, because it says <laughs> that the name of the song is "Thing We Said Today." <laughs> so we're gonna have to change the name of our show, I guess. It's a thing we said today. <laughs> well, it let's... actually says that if you look. Oh, I'll have to watch it for a sixth time. <laughs> oh my God! Can I inter- interject some news here, guys? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. For uh, uh, the uh, this is about the Beatles uh, live at the Hollywood Bowl CD, mm-hmm. and I and I deliberately kept it shielded from you guys so you would so you could all gasp and say whatever. But it will debut at number seven this week. Oh, Very nice. nice. Okay. It has sold. Nice. It has, Billboard says it has sold thirty six thousand units. Thirty five thousand of that being traditional album sales. And it also says the last top ten was 2013 with On Air Live at the BBC Volume Two, right? Mm-hmm. Which also hit number seven. So. I can't help but feel that if they had given us both shows complete and with less reverb, it would have zoomed to number one. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Oh, you're not. Oh, okay. All right. Anyway. As Jeff Jones apparently said in Los Angeles, this is why God created bootlegs. <laughs> he said that. Oh, it's a matter. As a matter of fact, Alan, I did want to ask how you felt about those those composites in in the Shea Stadium film, the things like Twist and Shout and Act Naturally and and uh, Babies in Black and whatever else there might have been that seemed yeah. to have um, you know some some live vocal and some studio mm. instrumentation and uh, perhaps one performance has flown in from somewhere else. And how did you feel about that? Well, I, you know, I always would prefer it to be exactly what happened, you mm. know, um, especially since, you know, we've, but we'll, we've heard, we've heard the actual recordings and there are right. places that were problematic and, you know, okay, you know, for the broader audience, a fix may be necessary and that's why God created bootlegs. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that flying in the um, pretty much the whole studio version of Twist and Shout was yeah. excessive. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think, I think that, that was necessary. I, I think that was absolutely stupid, if, if, yeah. if you want to call it that. I mean, why, do, why would you allow the raw audio of Act Naturally and not the and then not Twist and Shout? Twist Especially, and Shout was not bad. Especially because yeah. you can tell, you know, it just like sounds it, and yeah, uh, you know what? Right. I don't know. Hey, it, you know. Had, it had the echo. It had the it was the the echo. It had the uh, studio echo in there. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't miss it. You know, from uh, with twist and shout. And yeah. I thought I I couldn't believe that. That really surprised me. Right. And and I mean the the act naturally was was a nice surprise, and I actually thought that was wonderful, but. Twist and Shout just made me kind of shake my head a little bit. I mean, the rest of it didn't sound bad. People have said that they, were, they noticed other things added. I didn't notice that, but you couldn't miss Twist and Shout. Yeah. So. You know what I'd like to, to know most of all um, mm -hmm. is between Paul and Ringo and Yoko and Olivia, how involved they were in this whole thing. Did they just give material to Ron Howard and to his staff and then – they chose what to use because if you follow the interview, there was one interview on Facebook in particular where Paul and Ringo are asked what they think of the film and they hadn't seen it yet. Yeah, so right. all that we said, rough cut. you know, all, right. all this time we've been saying that nothing goes out without the Beatles' approval. Here's a film and Paul and Ringo haven't seen it. Right. And the finished product is out there. So, but they did, they said they did see a rough cut. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they felt that, okay, Ron Howard is an artist and who, who they respect and they're trusting him. Maybe this was that's, a, that's an exactly, example of trust, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, beyond that, what they normally do. That's what they were saying, that because they were familiar with Howard's work, that they, you know, they basically put it in his hands. And they only gave him material that I guess they were comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I, that, I think that's pretty obvious. Because they, I mean, they didn't, they didn't dig anything unusual up. So, but do you want to, you guys want to grade it? Hmm. No. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd give it an eight. An eight? Well, I was going to, okay. Um, I think I'd get, I'd go for uh, probably a seven and a half, actually. Hmm. If you're going to grant, if you're going to do it that way. I'll give it an eight and a half. Mm -hmm. I'll be the curmudgeon and not uh, not do a uh, a number a number grade. <laughs> okay, giving it a letter grade. Yeah, I would give it um I would give it a B plus. Okay. All right. So that's like a seven point five. <laughs> something like something like yeah, that. Maybe eight. Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. I think I think uh, you know as a you know as a documentary, and I'm a I'm a fan of documentaries. I think actually it was done, it was done very well, but there were some problems with pacing and and uh, you know lack of uh, lack of music, uh, especially from certain crucial points. Mm -hmm. But uh, but overall, yeah, overall I think it was very well done. If you could, if you could put yourself in the mind of a new Beatle fan, like a new teenager, 
watching this mm-hmm. for the first time, would it make you more curious to investigate the Beatles and their music and their history? Hmm. I, I would think so. That's hard to answer because it, from our perspective, it, you'd have to eliminate, you'd have to just exit everything out of your mind. Um, probably, it, it probably would because they were so, they were, their history is so unique and, and the reaction, the social reaction was just so crazy. It's not like, you know, it's not like Justin Bieber. It's not like you know. It's nothing like you know. One Direction. It's not. It's it's like none of those. Oh guys. well, it was uh, you know t- twenty times greater than you know. Right. It's 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 like a story that I've t- uh, told over the years about um, uh, back in the days of uh, Total Request Live when that was MTV's big show, and when in in sync was the big hot you know, boy band of the moment. And there were, uh, I don't know, there was one time there were a couple of thousand girls uh, lined up in front of the MTV studios and the father of one of the girls is there and he's saying, oh, it's just like the Beatles. Yeah. No, if it was just <laughs> like the Beatles, Times Square, which is you know where the, uh, the MTV studios, I guess, still are, would have been paralyzed. You know, mm-hmm. you wouldn't have been able to move in Times Square. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, in fact, some of that, some of that footage is is pretty scary. It's it really uh, it shows you just how how huge the phenomenon was. Do you remember early in the film they they had um, they were talking about a BBC performance the Beatles were giving. And outside the building, there was a line. They said a mile long to get mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. A mile. Yeah. Yep. That's extraordinary. That's beyond yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But that yeah. that shows you. I mean, that's just. Uh, I mean, look at those scenes in Australia, where, <laughs> and or or even you know Liverpool, when they uh, when they went there for the you know the 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 premiere of a Hard Day's Night. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, where the whole city turned out. It was, right. uh, it was just, you know, it's the, I thought of this when I also, when I saw the anthology, uh, for the first time it was like some of the, fo- some of the, the footage is, is almost scary in the scope of the, you know, as, as George always put it of the, the mania. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I thought it was also a, a good um, a good moment where they they show Paul in 1964 being interviewed, and the question is, you know, what do you where do you think you guys sort of, you know, stand in the history of the culture? And Paul's, oh yeah, <laughs> are you right. kidding with that question? But that turned out to have been a really good question. Yeah, <laughs> it couldn't be answered at the time, but we can answer it now. You know? Mm. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and, and in fact. Uh, Larry Kane uh, in the film mentions uh, something similar to the introduction that Jimmy O'Neill gave them when they appeared on Shindig, basically saying that they were the entertainment phenomenon of the century. And mm-hmm. uh, and I don't think there's any uh, I don't think there's any question of that. And seeing a film like this, I think, reinforces that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this has been an awful lot of fun. I think all of us can sit here talking about this film uh, for you know pretty much the foreseeable future, but <laughs> it's it's time to go, and uh, so we'll go around and uh, talk about what else we've got going on. How you can contact us? Uh, let's start with Al. Uh, you can contact me on Facebook at Al Sussman uh, or at Twitter at. A S U S S forty nine, or through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com, or uh, uh, Parading Press, www.paradingpress.com for Change in Times, hundred and one days to shape the generation. And Steve, um, you can contact me at beetlesexaminer at gmail.com. I have a personal page on facebook i also have a beatles news group called beatles news and commentary which you're all welcome to join and comment on beatles stories uh and uh, i also have a an ebook very very inexpensive ebook called uh, meet a monkey davy jones with my interviews with davy jones 
Okay, and can you have, as usual, some contests going, I believe? Funny you mention that, Alan. Uh, mm. on, on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, where I have my Beatles trivia and games page, you always have one of nine prizes to pick from every single week. And I now have the Beatles Live at the Hollywood Bowl CD as one of the nine prizes that you could win. So um, there's a new contest. There's a new trivia question or game every Monday, and you have a full week to answer. And I also just want to say, because this is a, I'm doing this a little bit more often now on a more local level, if you happen to live in the New England area, I'm giving away tickets for you to see the Fab Faux in concert. Mm-hmm. They're going to be playing at the uh, at College Street Music Hall in New Haven, Connecticut on October the 1st. And right around the time that uh, this show airs and gets posted, you have uh, a week to enter to win a pair of tickets. Great uh, cover band for uh, Beatles music. Great musicians, as you probably know, Will Lee, Jimmy Vivino. Those guys. So uh, go to my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay. Um, might as well promote my books as well. Um, I, I have a book called The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, published by Fiden. Um, you can get it almost anywhere that sells books and happens to have it. <laughs> You can also get it on Amazon. Um, and I have an ebook uh, published by New York Times Books, and it's called Got That Something How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. Both books deal with a lot of the stuff covered in the movie. And uh, yeah, that one is also at Amazon.com. I think you can get it at iTunes as well and wherever ebooks are sold. Uh, you can. <laughs> in the ether you can write to you can contact me at alan cozen on facebook or alan cozen remixed you can also write to all of us uh we have an email address things we said today radio show at gmail.com and we pretty much try to respond to comments complaints and suggestions Um, suggestions we consider you know as potential shows so and I should me- I should mention that when when Alan is on Facebook, you never know. Sometimes he'll end up getting into a lively conversation with with, <laughs> pe- with people such as we had a uh, weekend before last. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It gets, it's uh, you know lots of fun. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter at at symbol things we said today fab. So for Ken Michaels, Al Sussman, Steve Marinucci, I'm Alan Cozen, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.